Okay, Paul, we are streaming. Very good. Welcome everybody to New Jersey Astronomical Association. Uh, this is our monthly presentation, and tonight's presentation is going to be about uh, what it's like to live on the International Space Station. I'm the uh, narrator. My name is Paul Cirillo. Okay, and Paul. we are streaming. Very good. Welcome, everybody, to New Jersey Astronomical Association. And uh, let me just get the uh, first slide going here. The uh, topics that I'm going to talk about tonight are the construction of the station and then uh, what it's like to actually uh, live on the station, some of the day-to-day -day things that you need to do, uh, some of the experiments that are being done, and how you get there and back. How do astronauts and cosmonauts get up to the space station and how do they return? And actually what's very intriguing is what's next? Uh, for the future of the space station. I have been an amateur astronomer all my life. I belong to the largest public observatory in New Jersey, New Jersey Astronomical Association. I've been a member for a very long time. And I also do volunteer speaking for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to schools. Um, <clears throat> I'll say more about that at the end. Let me also just mention now that everything I'm doing is on PowerPoint. So I'm going to turn off my camera and you can turn off that little video in the corner because it's no sense just seeing a, a talking head here. So just sit back and enjoy the uh, wonderful PowerPoint slides. So if we, if we think back to science and science fiction, uh, because science fiction has been around for a long time, I, I have been and always will be a, a fan of it. And in all the science fiction stories I read growing up, there was always something about a space station if there was any kind of space travel involved. Um, it was uh, finally in the 1950s when somebody was seriously talking about it. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Werner von Braun, uh, the head of uh, <clears throat> the uh, Saturn rocket program at NASA. And uh, here he is uh, talking about a possible uh, future space station. And he's showing here, they're, they're always showed circular like this because the idea is you want to have some sort of artificial type gravity or you want to simulate gravity. And so one way to do that in space is to slowly spin the structure um, and you get some semblance of gravity, but not really true uh, gravity. So he's showing that effect here. Um, I even saw space stations on Star Trek. Uh, here it is back in 1967. And then of course the... Uh, the fantastic space station of 2001 a Space Odyssey, which believe it or not, was way back in 1968. And uh, Stanley Kubrick really had his uh, eyes on this. Um, what you see there at the bottom is uh, um, the interior of the space station. And you can see how it's curving up in the distance. And of course, the, uh, the hot pink outfits of the flight attendants of the rockets that went back and forth to it. But in reality, it was 1984 when President Reagan uh, directed NASA to build a space station. And it was quickly evident that the United States couldn't um, fund um, that type of undertaking all by themselves. They were going to need the cooperation of as many countries as possible, both not only with monetary uh, on a monetary level, but also on an equipment level. And so a consortium of 15 countries was put together. The uh, United States, Russia, Canada, Japan, and Europe uh, were the five main countries. When I say Europe, that is comprised of the European Space Agency, which I've listed all the countries that are part of that. And so altogether, it's 15 countries, and it was five different uh, space organizations from NASA to ESA. So uh, they, had, uh, they made their agreements, they got their plans together, they started designing, and it was time to actually build the equipment and start assembling. And so it started at the end of the last uh, 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 century, and uh, in uh, Russia was putting together a very large, powerful module. It was called Zarya. And it was very important because it was going to provide the initial power source uh, guidance and propulsion. 
this is what the uh, inside of Zarya looked like. And it was launched in 1998 abo aboard one of their Proton rockets. And there on the right, you see it actually in space waiting for the next segment. And the very next segment was a segment built by the United States and it was called Unity. And actually it was nothing more than a big connecting block. A, uh, the space shuttle Endeavor brought it up and it connected it with the Zarya module and bingo, now you've got two modules connected. And so there begins the International Space Station, 1998 with the Unity and the Zarya modules. So that's how it began. It took two more years though, and a few more modules and some solar cells and other things to make it livable uh, before an actual crew was able to stay on board. So it was November of 2000, where a three person crew went up and occupied the station for 136 days. Now it's been, uh, this is the sticker for the 20th anniversary from, for ISS, but we're almost in November. So we're just about crossing the 21 year boundary. It's quite an accomplishment. So going back again to 2000, um, that was just the beginnings of the station. And so the space shuttle was a major, uh, played a major role in bringing up segments. Um, also the uh, Russians uh, brought up other segments on their Soyuz vehicles. But uh, here's just a quick uh, segment uh, segmentation showing you the different modules that we're starting to put on. You can see uh, more solar uh, cells, solar panels are being put on. Um, this one, uh, one of the early pieces that was added was the uh, Canada, um, uh, uh, the, the Canada uh, space arm. And <clears throat> that's at the bottom there. This is a, uh, you can see a, a bigger picture over here. It's called Canada Arm. Canada Arm 2, because Canada Arm 1 was on the space shuttle. But this is a very important piece because this is just kind of like a crane at a construction site. It could be operated from inside the station and it could move parts and modules outside the station. So it's always been very useful. For example, here, jump ahead to the future. Here's the Canada arm latching onto a Dragon spacecraft, a cargo spacecraft to bring it into the space station. Um, it also is used often to simply hold on to an astronaut. That's a foot restraint there on, he's on there. And uh, that uh, allows the astronaut to be moved to different parts of the station so that they can work because it's tough without uh, the force of gravity holding you down and you can very easily float around. So the arm provides some stability for that. So that was a great, uh, a great, comp a great part of the station and it's still being used to this day. Here we are now 2007, you can see some major solar panels now being added, 2008 even more, 2009, it's pretty much complete by somewhere around 2009 or 2000, uh, 2011, it was officially complete meaning it could now sustain crews for long periods of time. But the station is constantly always having something added to it. So it's never really complete. Let's just do some quick uh, uh, facts and figures. If you brought the whole space station down, including the solar panels, it could just about fit uh, a United States football field. Um, it's um, 218 feet long along one axis, 310 feet along another. If you wanted to weigh all the components on Earth, it would be just about a million pounds. And uh, if you're into a cubic feet of uh, habitable volume, it's something like 13,000 cubic feet of volume. So it's quite roomy on the inside. And right now the current uh, crew complement is seven people. Let's talk about power and control for a moment because everything needs power and you need control. And so the station uses uh, solar uh, arrays and uh, it has a complement of four sections of four. And um, at, in total, they generate somewhere between 75 and 90 kilowatts of power, which is a lot of power and it gets used very, very quickly. On that uh, Zarya module, the very first one that went up, that one is the only thing on the station that has any kind of rocket engines. Uh, they're small engines, but you don't need a lot they just use it to raise and lower the orbit of the station from time to time. But what keeps it steady 
are the same thing that we've been using ever since I can remember as a kid playing with gyroscopes, except these are gigantic. The, the control moment gyroscope, as they talk about them here, uh, are pretty formidable. There's four of them. Uh, they're spinning at thousands of revolution a minute, and uh, they, uh, they provide the stability uh, for the station. You can see how big they are compared to the workers next to them. So they're running all the time, and that uh, is pretty much what's needed to control the station. You've got power, you've got uh, stability, and uh, rocket power to adjust your orbit. Okay, now how about living? Living on the space station is very, very interesting because you're now in what is known as a microgravity environment. Now, this is uh, something that's a, a little bit interesting, and I'm going to talk about it in a, in a slide down the road here. But... <clears throat> There is gravity on the space station. There's gravity everywhere in the universe. It's just, is it a lot of gravity or a low amount of gravity? And so on the station, it's, it's, it's negligible, and so it's called microgravity. Zero G is really not the right term, so they invented this term. But what happens to the human body when you uh, have extended periods in microgravity? Well, you lose muscle mass and you lose bone density. It happens almost immediately to the astronauts. And it's quite obvious why it happens. It's because uh, there's no force of gravity to pull against your muscles. And so they say, oh, I don't need muscles to hold up this person. We're not standing. We're just floating. It's like floating in a, in a pool. Don't need these muscles, strong muscles in my legs or back. And so they start to deteriorate. Same thing with the bones. Bones don't need to be as thick as they are on Earth because, again, um, no gravity to be pulling at you. And so this is okay, uh, but it's not okay if you want to come back to Earth. Uh, because whenever you come back, say six months or a year later, you're not going to be able to stand or probably even breathe. And gosh knows what your heart's going to be trying to do because it's nothing but a big muscle. And so that has to be mitigated somehow. There's also a danger of radiation because you're high above the atmosphere. You're still within the uh, the Van Allen, uh, the radiation belt, and you're still within Earth's magnetic field, but you are being exposed to more radiation than you would if you were on the ground. Um, they also found that uh, sometimes in some astronauts, their vision changes. Um, it deteriorates. Uh, something about the eyeball loses its shape. And what's really interesting is that it doesn't correct once they come back to Earth. Some do, some don't. So they're looking at that very, very carefully. And of course, you've got that typical uh, circadian rhythm disruption. Uh, it's like being in an isolated place because the windows are not obvious. So you can't really see day and night very easily. And, you know, you've got the typical isolation and noise. So all those things are, are what affects you once you're in space for a long period of time. And, of course, uh, what's the main answer to this? Exercise. Haven't we heard that before? Diet and exercise. Well, it's the same thing uh, for these astronauts. Um, they need to keep their cardiovascular health uh, in shape. They need to maintain their muscle, muscle strength and their bone mass. And the best way to do it is exercise. Now, I do believe they have some special medications that they can take to help with this, but nothing beats good old exercise. And so they had to basically bring uh, gymnasium equipment up to the station, specialized equipment, to do the same type of things that an exercise bicycle, bicycle a treadmill, and free weights can do. I'm going to show you a few of that here. Of course, they just can't call it a bicycle and, and things like that. <clears throat> NASA calls it a CVIS, a cycle ergonometer with vibration isolation system. And what that means is that you can see the astronaut here pedaling away. But again, because of the microgravity, if he wasn't strapped down like he is, he would just go floating right off the bicycle and it wouldn't provide any resistance at all. And so all the gym equipment has to be uh, constructed with the with, uh, low gravity in mind. And so everywhere uh, there's any kind of equipment, you're sort of strapped down. So you can see them strapped down there. And actually, if you look carefully, there's no bicycle seat um, because it doesn't make sense to sit on anything. Um, you can also see how the, the frame in the background is free floating. That's because they found early on when someone was on the bicycle, it shook the whole station. And so they said, no, this isn't gonna work. And so they changed this to be uh, sort of isolated from the rest of the station. 
<clears throat> excuse me. Uh, same thing with the treadmill. Um, you uh, uh, run along it, and you're actually pulling, you know, the tread with you. But something's got to hold you down. So again, you can. This is Karen Nyberg, and you can see how the uh, straps are holding it down to the treadmill, or else she would just go flying off into the station. Again, you can see how it's isolated from the station. Now. There's just one thing I kind of want to mention here. Oh, I should have went back to it. Look at the name of the treadmill. Remember I said it can't be just called a treadmill? Now, this is called a combined operational load, load bearing external resistance treadmill. And if you take the first letters of all those uh, words, it comes out to Colbert. Well, doesn't that sound familiar? Well, here's, uh, here's Mr. Colbert here. And turns out he was a very big fan of a big fan of the space exploration and NASA, and so he was campaigning to get them to name one of the new modules on the station for him. And so here's astronaut uh, Sonny Williams talking to him in 2009, saying, telling him she has a major announcement that he's going to be interested in. And so he was very, very excited. Oh, boy, they're going to name a new module for me. And she said, no, we named that new module Tranquility, but we are naming this new exercise uh, piece of equipment for you. And so that's why it's called the Colbert. And that sticker you see there is right on the uh, that machine, and everybody sees it when they exercise. And he was he was tickled pink that there's a piece of equipment on the station named for him. So just a little bit of a interesting uh, aside there. There's one more: the bicycle and the uh, uh, and the treadmill take care of uh, a, a good part of the physical rehabilitation, uh, but also there's nothing like free weights. But again, can't just call it free weights. It's called the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, or the ARED. And you can see an astronaut here exercising his upper body. But this thing can be configured in so many different ways. It can exercise all different muscle groups. So it's a great device. Now, the one interesting thing about all this exercise is they have to take, they have to schedule two hours every day to do this. That includes setup and takedown. So two hours every day for every day they're on the station. Wow. But if they don't, then it's uh, not going to be a good thing to do. This is just some uh, short video. Doesn't matter whether you're sideways, whatever. Here's that same A-Red I was mentioning before, and now he's using it for squats. That squats, the other one was the back. There's another uh, <clears throat> type of bicycle um, exercising his legs there. And here's uh, the uh, different kind of uh, tension system. It's almost like uh, um, different kinds of resistive devices just to help you uh, keep all your muscle groups in shape. And it's worked well. Um, if you ever watch uh, when astronauts are recovered from six months into space, sure, they're put in chairs right away, but the next day they're walking around and uh, everything is, is pretty good. So overall, they've had great success with mitigating the effects of weightless, of, of low gravity on them. How about the other um, daily uh, acts of living and so keeping yourself clean? Well, no such thing as a shower on the station because if you sprayed water, it would just turn into globs of water bubbles and it wouldn't even stick to you and make a mess. And so it, you, living on the space station is kind of like living in a camper for an extended period of time. Sure, you got a bathroom, but there's no shower or tub and whatnot. And so you have to make do with what you have. And so this is a, uh, a uh, sort of a waterless uh, shampoo that they use. They just um, rub it into their hair and they towel dry it and it cleans their hair as well as uh, their bodies as well. They have washcloths that they, that they wet and then they wash their bodies that way. So they take care of uh, themselves that way. Um, there's, the only time they really sweat on the station is when they're exercising. So there's not a lot of uh, uh, reason to be too, too dirty. This is Karen Nyberg again, and she was, uh, this is a still out of a video, but she was showing how she brushes out her hair. Now she's got extremely long hair too, and she just got done uh, shampooing it and now she's brushing it out. And you'll notice she's standing right by the vent there. And so any water droplets that are coming off of there are getting sucked right into the vent. 
and that's how they keep the keep the station clean. Speaking of hair, hair for most people grows, and uh, again, most of the uh, astronauts are up there for about six months at a time, sometimes longer, and so your hair grows and needs to be attended to, and so you see the usual uh, scissors and comb there being held up, but uh, there's another piece of a oh that's the scissors and comb there and you've got another piece of equipment here which is not part of the normal routine of getting your hair cut and as you might expect that's a vacuum hose uh, because the little bits of hair have got to go somewhere and they don't want them floating around getting into equipment getting into your eyes getting into food and god knows where and so that's all sucked up by the vacuum there to keep things clean again speaking of hair uh, i just want to mention uh, if you've got hair it's never a good hair day in space. Uh, this is Dr. Sandra Magnus on the left on Earth, and there she is on the right on the station after a few days. I'm sure she would pick one picture over the other for her album. Um, I'll just give you one more. Here's Kate Rubens, which was up recently on the top right. Very lovely picture of her with her hair sculptured very nicely. But once she's on the station, she just tosses a, uh, a hair band in there and uh, whatever's going on behind her doesn't bother her. Last one about here. Uh, astronaut Marsha Ivins just had the, the, the best long hair of all of them, and she decided to treat everybody. So right after she shampooed it and before it was all dried out, uh, she just let it fly and said, quick, take a picture and no one's going to believe this. And so there's Marsha uh, spouting a nice head of hair. There's also other things to do on the station. Sometimes you've got to go out and fix things. And so they have EVA suits to do this. Any astronaut that I've ever heard talk about a spacewalk that tells says it's a it's an absolute fantastic uh, experience. They're they're in their own little spaceship, the EVA suit. Uh, sure, they're working and whatnot. And they're out there for hours at a time, sometimes seven, eight hours. Uh, but uh, every now and then they get to look down, and there's the Earth, uh, beautiful Earth, right beneath them, and then above them the stars. And so it's just truly, truly uh, magnificent. Look at this shot. There's actually two astronauts there, if you can make them out. Uh, but how would you like to be working like there with the Earth in the background? Only 225 miles away. Um, 225, 250 miles. That's, that's all this is. Okay, we've uh, got ourselves cleaned up. We've done our exercises. Now it's time to eat. And so, again, think like being in a camper. Uh, you don't have all the refrigeration and, uh, and cooking utensils at your, at your, at the, available to you. And so everything is prepackaged, sometimes pre-cooked, uh, sealed, hermetically sealed in plastic or cans and whatnot. And then they're, they're taken out and you prepare your meal. So going clockwise from the left there, that's a, a plastic bag of apricot juice, some dried fruit up top, some bread, then some lamb with vegetable in a can, and then some good old lasagna in a pouch. And uh, this is a crew plus a, a, a group of uh, seven visitors from the uh, uh, space shuttle. And so that's why you have a lot of people here. And so they, they broke out the table and they had dinner together. And you can see what a glorious mess it looks like because uh, you can't put things on plates. Things will float around. So you pretty much have to eat with a spoon out of the pouches and out of the cans. But again, I'm told it's, it's very nutritious and very tasty and they get along just fine. But look at the table also. You'll notice that there's lots of Velcro and straps laying around too. And so every time you put something down like a spoon or whatnot, there's a piece of Velcro on it to attach so it doesn't go floating away. And if it doesn't have Velcro, then there's a strap to put it on. So you just have to be very careful and uh, you can uh, get along with the food uh, just fine. Here's a, here's a short video of an example. Hello everyone, I'm gonna show you how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich from the International Space Station. Uh, every time we eat, it's kind of fun. Uh, everything will float around if you don't manage it. So we have some tape to stick things on on our table here, as well as a bunch of Velcro. All right, so the first thing we need for our sandwich is a piece of bread. Well, up here, we don't have bread like you do on Earth, but we have tortillas. So we use tortillas a lot for uh, sandwiches. So that's what I'm going to use for my peanut butter and jelly. I'm going to stick that down to some tape here so it doesn't go floating away while I'm getting everything else ready. So I'll get my peanut butter out and uh, even the lids on the peanut butter. 
have a piece of Velcro on it so they don't go floating away. If I let it go, it'll kind of just float there um, for a little while and then eventually the, the air conditioning system in here will take it away somewhere else. So I don't want to lose it. Um, so I'm going to stick it on the table. I'll scoop out some peanut butter for my sandwich. I got to stick this somewhere, otherwise it just goes floating away too. But just for now, if it's just a few seconds like this, I can just leave it and let it float. I'll spread the peanut butter on my sandwich and the tortilla. And then I get my jelly ready. It's a lot of things you got to think about and manage while you're, while you're eating up here. And you just spread the jelly on the sandwich. That as well needs to get uh, attached to the table. So there's my peanut butter and jelly tortilla or sandwich. From up here, I'll just kind of close it up and enjoy. Let's see if you guys can enjoy it as it's coming to you. So <clears throat> that's a very good example of how you have to manage food. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention there's about 11 people watching. And uh, if you have a, I'll be taking questions at the end of the hour. Uh, but if you have a burning question as I'm talking, feel free to unmute yourself and, and say, hey, Paul, I got a question and I'll try to answer it right away. But if you could try to hold off till till the end. Um, this smiling astronaut is Samantha Cristoforetti of the European Space Agency, the Italian Space Agency, actually. And she's very happy because the, uh, the Italian uh, scientists decided to help her out since she was going to be on station for a long time. And she was a, uh, a, a coffee lover. And so they actually figured out how to make espresso in space. And so it's a special machine that's adapted for low gravity. And I love the name. It's called IS Espresso. And so she's very happy that they got an espresso machine. So little by little, they're getting as many creature comforts as they can. Now, I keep mentioning microgravity and low gravity. So let me just quickly mention uh, what this is all about, because it's not zero G. Um, picture a, a, a cannon on top of a mountain. And you take a cannonball, put it in there, put some gunpowder in it, and you fire it off. And it flies off, and then it falls to the ground. So that would be spot A. Um, then someone says, hey, let's put more powder in it and shoot it again. So you do. And now the cannonball lands over by, part, uh, by spot B. And someone says, well, what in case we put so much powder in it that it goes all the way out as far as it can? And that would be spot C. But look what happens when it gets to spot C. It doesn't fall back to the ground because the ground's not there. By the time it starts to fall back to the earth, the curvature of the earth has appeared and it's, it, it's not falling down because the base of the earth is not there. And so what happens is cannonball C just keeps on going around the earth. And that's basically an orbit when, you're, when you go into orbit. And so if you have an object that's going fast enough and parallel to the Earth's surface, you can then go into orbit around the Earth and you're actually free falling around the Earth. You're, you're, you're constantly falling, but the Earth is not there when you would normally fall to the ground because of the curvature of the Earth. And so that's why you hear the words free fall. And, uh, and that's what's happening to the space station and everything and everybody that's on it. So it appears that there's no gravity because everybody's falling at the same rate. It's kind of that feeling you get if you're on one of those crazy amusement rides where they just drop you, uh, raise you up high and drop you. You're actually uh, pretty much weightless as you're coming down. That's why you're strapped in so much. And so this is what's happening all the time. And so the, the correct term is you're in free fall. And, um, and so that's why, yes, there's gravity. Um, but you don't sense it because you're falling all the time. If there was a giant hand that could reach out and grab the station and just stop it, it would fall right down to the earth because it would lose that momentum of the orbit. Okay. So free fall, and they use the term microgravity for a little bit of gravity. So same kind of thing, but it's not zero G to be specific. And by the way, the space station at an altitude of 250 miles has to go 17,500 miles an hour. At pretty close to that speed in order to maintain that free fall orbit. If they go any faster, they'll spin off the Earth 
If they go any slower, they'll come crashing down. So you'll hear that number a lot when you listen to NASA. Okay, just wanted to get that out of the way. So everybody's floating around and it feels wonderful, but it's been a long day and it's time for bedtime. How do you sleep on the space station? Well, it's actually kind of quite relaxing because again, there's no stresses on you, but there's no such thing as a bed either because you can't lay down on something because there's no down. And so it can be a little disconcerting and sometimes some astronauts have to get used to how they want to do this. And there's several different ways of doing it. Um, um, the astronaut on the right is crawling into a little cubicle and what she does is uh, just kind of closes the door and straps herself in and, uh, and turns out the lights and closes her eyes and she just floats in there and uh, yep, that's how she sleeps. And uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Japanese astronaut there on the left, uh, he zips himself up into like this giant sleeping bag, hangs it on the wall and uh, or attaches it to the wall rather and he just... Uh, floats there um, during uh, during his sleep period. You don't want to be just floating around the station because you don't want to start bumping into things. So somehow they kind of contain themselves and uh, get their shut eye that way. To explain this just a little bit more, I'm going to let you listen to a real astronaut. This is a great astronaut. Her name is Sunny Williams, and she's spent two whole missions uh, on the space station, but she's logged over 300 days on the space station, including 500 hours outside the station in, uh, in uh, EVA suits. And she's also a Navy captain, a, a helicopter a pilot, test pilot. So um, she's uh, quite, quite an amazing individual. So I'm gonna let Suni talk to you a little bit about sleeping and living on the station. Hello, I'm Sunny Williams. I'm up here on the International Space Station. So this is Node 2. This is a really cool module. Notice her hair. Um, of course, most of these modules, you'll see they have four sides, uh, and they're put together. That way we could sort of walk, work on a flat plane, either a wall, a floor, another wall, or the ceiling. But, you know, again, all you have to do is turn yourself and your reference changes. The reason I'm bringing that up is because this is where four out of six of us sleep. And so people always ask about sleeping in space. Do you lie down? Are you in a bed? Um, not really, because it doesn't matter. You don't really have the sensation of lying down. You just sit in your sleeping bag. So here's one sleep station right here. I'm going in right now. You can follow me if you want. So I'm inside. It's sort of like a little phone booth. Um, but it's pretty comfy. I've got a sleeping bag right here that we sleep in so we don't have a, sort of like a little bit of a cover. We don't fly all over the place. Um, but you know, you can sleep in any orientation. I have it sleeping, feeling like I'm standing up right now, but like you saw, I'm on the floor, but it doesn't matter if I turn over and I sleep upside down. I can't have it, I don't have any sensation in my head that tells me that I'm upside down, so it really doesn't matter. The sleep station is also like a little office. We've got a computer in here. As you can see, we've got a couple little toys. I've got some books. I've got some clothes and other things that make it sort of like home. I'm coming out. And just for reference, that's one sleep station. This one's another right here. There's one on the ceiling, if you want to call it right here, and then there's a fourth on the other wall over here. So all of us sleep in a little bit of a, a circle. Here's a pretty cool place. This is sort of like in your house where everybody meets in the morning. Uh, after you wash your face, brush your teeth, you want to find something for breakfast. And this is our kitchen. You might notice there's all sorts of foods here. Uh, it's like opening the refrigerator. You got all your different stuff that you want to have. Drinks, meats, eggs, vegetables, cereals, uh, bread, uh, snacks. And that's a good place. That's where you find all the candy. Uh, side dishes and then some little power bars just in case. So we have all this type of food. Some of it is dehydrated. And so we have to hydrate it, fill it up with water. Some of it is already made. And then all we have to do is heat it up. So something like this, I'm pulling out barbecued beef brisket. 
pretty yummy. Not only is this food made in the U.S., but we also have food here from Japan. Uh, we've got Russian food. As you can see, all these red containers are filled with food that's from Russia. Um, and then we get some of our specialty stuff, some things that we like, some of our favorite stuff that your family can send up. In fact, I like fluffernutters, and so I got sent up some fluff so I could make my fluffernutter with peanut butter. So you have a lot of food up here, no problems. So that's uh, better to hear it uh, from an astronaut than having me tell you. Um, there's one more uh, short video about uh, playing with pudding. This is going to be pudding, the space way. Now his feet are in restraints. Uh, it's a strap that's on the floor. So that's how he's holding himself steady. But you'll notice as he's playing with the pudding, he loses his footing and he goes flying. He wasn't expecting that. And there goes his feet. <laughs> So you can have uh, fun with your food on the station as well. Okay, so that's about it, right? I talked about uh, cleanliness, uh, about how you eat, how you sleep, and that just about takes care of all normal daily uh, things that you do, right? Oh, I'm sure you're thinking about this. How do you go to bathroom in space? Well, just let's start off with uh, the room on the left is the American toilet. The one on the right is the Russian toilet. They're pretty much the same thing. And um, I'm going to let uh, a real astronaut tell you uh, about this process. Um, this is uh, Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield, and he does an excellent job. When you go to the bathroom on Earth, you're relying on gravity. Pretty, pretty heavily. Imagine if you were halfway done and there were, somebody shut off gravity, it would be a mess. And you'd float off the toilet. So, so when, we, when we designed our space toilet, first it has to have a seat belt on it to hold you down. And then we decided to separate solids and liquids because they're easier to store that way. So we just have a tube that you pee into and it has air pulled into the tube, so it's not a big deal. For the women, there's a cup fits up against them. For the guys, it's just like a little funnel. You just pee into this tube, and it goes into a, into a sewage tank. But the solids that come out of your body, that's a harder problem to solve, and it's an important medical one, because on Earth, everything falls on the floor, but in space, it's going to float around. So, so it, it'll really make you sick. If you re-ingest something that came out of your body, it will really make you sick. And we can't afford to get that sick. So we designed a toilet that instead of gravity pulling everything into the toilet, it has air flow. There's air pulled down into the toilet. Sort of windy when you're sitting there, but it pulls everything out of your body. Everything that comes out of your body gets pulled down into the toilet by the air. And then in the storage tank, we just expose that to the vacuum of space. So it basically just freeze dries everything. So it kills all the bacteria so that there's no smell. And then that, that, we just store it. And then when you have a whole bunch of it stored, we put it in a little unmanned supply ship and we undock it and it burns up in the atmosphere. So the next time you see a beautiful shooting star going across the sky, <laughs> that's what it might be. I can never do uh, explaining that uh, any better than Chris can. So I hope you enjoyed that. So that's pretty much how you live on the space station, but why? Why do all this? Why have a space station at all? Well, the obvious answer is, is that we want to learn how to live and uh, live and work in space, because if we're going to be space, a spacefaring species, we've got to learn how to do this, because there's not going to be gravity when, uh, when we're on a rocket ship going to uh, another planet or another asteroid or whatnot. So that's a good main part of it, how to, how to understand how to live uh, in microgravity. But also, uh, there are amazing benefits uh, that can be learned by being on the space station insofar as research. And so the United States actually uh, established what is known as a national laboratory on the space station, which means that anybody 
with a bona fide research uh, effort can apply to have their research uh, uh, taken, uh, 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 being done on the space station. And the reason you'd want to do it on the space station is sometimes the low gravity allows you to do things with um, um, uh, chemicals and organic compounds and processes that you can't do on Earth. So there's an entire book uh, put out by NASA about all the experiments that are being done on the space station. And so if you're interested in that, just, uh, just Google that and you'll find it. But the different areas that they're looking at, they're looking at life sciences, about disease modeling, and the re regenerative medicine, even crop sciences, uh, physical sciences, uh, about how we use our bodies here on the earth and how that changes when you're in space. Um, they're also learning how to do remote sensing uh, for areas on the earth, for the environment. And of course, technology development. Um, sometimes, <clears throat> again, in low gravity, you can do things with electronics and develop electronics and robotics that you can't do on Earth. And of course, with any time you do any of these things, there's always an education uh, fallout from that as well. So a lot of things are just helping, helping uh, students in the education area. So you have all these sciences uh, that are being done. And that's why if you ever hear the astronauts at a news conference about what they did that day, it's not about looking out the window or you know, floating around or, or anything like that. It's all, uh, well, we, we have 100 different experiments going today, and that's just one astronaut, and there's seven of them. And so the station is mainly outfitted with laboratories. Um, what I show you here are the four laboratories that are there right now. One's called Destiny, one called Columbus, um, uh, Cabo, and the, the JEM. These are all uh, sponsored by different countries. Uh, Destiny is the uh, United States uh, lab. Looks like a mess, doesn't it? Uh, but that's where the work is getting done. Here you see an astronaut in a bio chamber uh, doing some kind of an amazing experiment. Um, this is the Columbus Laboratory, which is um, worked by the European Space Agency. And um, this astronaut, let me see, I just have to read this. How the nervous system adapts to microgravity. Observations may improve the design of safer, safer space habitats, but it also helps patients on Earth with neurological diseases. And so that's the amazing thing. It's not just learning how to live in space, but it also helps people on Earth. And so NASA has a motto for the space station. It says, off the Earth, for the Earth. Now here's just a short clip. Um, uh, on this astronaut scientist talking about what she's working on with Parkinson's disease. Hey, good morning and welcome to ISS. Today uh, I am working on the Angie X uh, cancer trials up here on ISS. We've actually spent quite a bit of time working on this. And what we're looking at here is something called an endothelial cell. And an endothelial cell, you find these cells in every blood vessel in your body. And so people wonder why we're growing these cells up on ISS. And scientists believe that cells in the body grow very similar up here on ISS. A lot of times scientists try and grow these endothelial cells in the ground and they don't live for very long. And they think for some reason they grow better up here in space. And that's one of the things we're testing on, on orbit here. And you can see some of these cells right here on the computer. So why is this important? Well, endothelial cells help form blood supply and tumors need blood supply to get bigger and bigger. And all of us have had someone impacted by cancer, whether it's a family member or a friend. And so we're always thinking, how can we fight this cancer? Well, one thing we're looking at is, can we grow these cells on orbit to test new cancer drugs to prevent that blood supply from growing? And if we can stop that tumor blood supply from growing, then we can help beat that cancer. So that's just one of the science experiments we're looking at here on the space station. So. Uh, um, some of that I understood, some of that I didn't, but that just gives you the idea of the uh, enormity of the types of experiments that they're, that they're doing on the station. Constantly, constantly, hundreds of different experiments every day. This is always interesting. This is the Japanese module, Japanese laboratory. It's actually uh, got a second story to it, but it also has something very interesting. It's got a porch. And so um, that's, it's called the Kibo module. But uh, that porch you see off to the right, it ha they have their, their own little manipulator arm. And so they can do experiments where they want them exposed to the environment of, of space. 
And so there's a little special uh, platform just to do that. This is the inside of the Kibo. And if you ever see a news conference from the space station, the astronauts are always in here because it's the biggest and roomiest uh, part of the space station. Here's something that they needed to do. Um, they uh, Bringing up water to the space station is expensive because water is heavy. It's about eight pounds a gallon. And they use water, of course, for cleaning and for drinking. Uh, they also use it for making oxygen. Um, but uh, to try to reduce the amount of water that has to be uh, brought up by rocket ship, they re recover any waste water um, that they have on the station. And this is everything from uh, uh, sweat uh, that gets pulled into the vents, uh, urine, um, and any other waste water at all. All goes into this module here, and it's perfected to the point now where that all that stuff goes in one end, and what comes out is 100% pure water. Uh, so they've been able to reduce drastically the amount of water that has to come up uh, from Earth um, every month. And so that's just one amazing piece of equipment. And you can see again how this can be used here on Earth. Uh, something. Some of these processes could easily be brought to a, say, a storm ravaged area where the water supply has been contaminated, and this can help uh, people on Earth uh, recover. So, again, off the Earth for the Earth. It's not all work, though, there's a little bit of play, some kind of RR &R time. So, here's holidays, uh, everybody being a little bit uh, having a fun here. By the way, you'll notice the hats don't flop over, no gravity, so there's no reason for them to flop over. Uh, somehow he got a guitar up into the station to relax with. That's pretty good. Uh, here's Samantha Cristoforetti again. Uh, and I think it was a Star Trek anniversary date. And somehow she got a uniform up there to cosplay. Um, playing with fluids in the absolute uh, low uh, gravity fields is also kind of interesting. Uh, this is uh, uh, Mark Kelly. Uh, that's just what water would look like if you put it out into the environment there, it would just form into a glob. What he did there is he put a drop of food coloring in it. And now he's putting some red uh, food coloring in it. So looks like if you mix red and blue, I guess it turns green. And so that's why it looks strange. And then he got a brilliant idea. He put an antacid tablet into it. He shoved it inside. And so now it definitely looks like uh, you know an alien from someplace that's coming to invade the space station. But that's just some of the stuff you can do in your in your spare time. How do they get resupplied? Okay, um, there's seven people there. They're consuming air. They're consuming uh, food, uh, all cleaning products, everything, air. And so, how is it resupplied? Well, every couple of months, uh, a supply ship comes. And right now, there are four different kinds of supply ships that go to the space station. And this is, again, because remember, there's 15 countries that are supporting the space station. So the one that's been supplying the space station for a very long time is the uh, Russian Progress vehicle. Um, this is uh, what it looks like here. And uh, another one now, more recently, is the SpaceX uh, Dragon uh, uh, supply uh, craft goes up uh, every couple of months when the supplies are needed. What's good about the SpaceX uh, uh, spacecraft, uh, supply spacecraft, is that it can be recovered. It, when it comes back into the Earth, it doesn't burn up like the Soyuz does um, or the Progress does. It, uh, it comes down on parachutes. And so they use this a lot for experiments that have to be returned and, and reexamined here on Earth. So that's uh, good for that. Uh, Northrop Grumman right here in Wallops Island, uh, Virginia, or on the coast here, uh, is used to supply the station as well. It's basically a big cargo container. And then lastly, the uh, Japanese have uh, um, something they call a transfer vehicle that goes up with uh, supplies as well. And so you've got four different craft that can uh, constantly supply the station, and, uh, and away it goes. So that's a good thing to do. This is a picture taken of the station by a visiting uh, space shuttle, and you can see all those spacecraft attached to it. So it really is a very futuristic space station. I mean, you've got one, two, three, four uh, different uh, uh, sp uh, spacecraft attached at the same time. Two are vehicles that can take crew, because uh, they're the Soyuz, they can only take three each, and there's six on the station. So in case of evacuation, you need an escape.
but the other two are uh, supply craft. You can do a little sightseeing. Um, this is one of the last uh, pieces that was added to the station. It's called a cupola, and uh, it's a seven uh, window uh, 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 cover that goes on one of the, the segments, uh, six windows on the side, one on the top, and it's constantly facing the earth. And so I just love this picture of Tracy Dyson um, taking a moment to relax and she just curled up in there and she's just looking down at the beautiful earth as it uh, rotates uh, below her. Absolutely amazing, amazing view. Here's Karen again, um, also taking a look out of the uh, forward window, huge, the biggest window probably on the station. Um, this is also where they do a lot of the uh, uh, photography of earth when they're looking at something. Um, here's a, a few pictures I'm going to show you what it looks like from the station. Um, this is, of course, those bright lights there on the Earth or the evening lights from cities. Um, but also the green glow at the top is the aurora uh, from the poles. OK, this is probably the North Pole, but I can't say for sure. But that's what the aurora looks like uh, uh, from space around the Earth. Looks like a crown. See if you can. Uh, I, I know you're not. This is not an audience. You can't tell me, but. Just to yourselves, uh, what landmark do you think this is on Earth? I'll give you three seconds. One, two, three. Okay. If you guessed Hawaii, you were right. All right. If you've ever been to Waikiki Beach, that's it on the right-hand side. And if you've been to Waikiki Beach, you know Diamond Head is just off to one side. And so there's Diamond Head, which is an extinct volcano from space. This is probably pretty easy to recognize. Uh, these are the man-made palm islands in Dubai from 250 miles up. I'll bet you can recognize this as well. Never thought you'd see it from this angle, but those are, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the main pyramids of, of Egypt. And here's something close to home. This is a nighttime uh, shot of very clear skies of uh, New York City, uh, part of New Jersey, Manhattan Island. Uh, there's Manhattan Island right in the middle here. And you can see the downtown bright lights here. You can also see Central Park. Isn't that something? Uh, Central Park is outlined. Here's the George Washington Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge here, things like that. Um, this is the same shot. Uh, rever it, it's flipped around, but this is daytime. Again, Central Park. And uh, you can see all the boats on the Hudson River here as well. Pretty cool. OK, if some of you vacation in Cape Cod, this is Cape Cod from orbit. On, again, on a clear day. A little geography lesson. Here's Italy and Sicily. Can you recognize this country or countries? This is England, uh, Wales, and Scotland, and uh, a little bit of Ireland, too. And uh, London from space is very easy to recognize. That's the Thames River snaking its way through, uh, through London. And we would be remiss if we didn't add the City of Lights. This is Paris uh, from orbit, truly the City of Lights. Sometimes, though, uh, it's, uh, it's advantageous uh, to be in orbit uh, if there's some kind of uh, a disaster condition on Earth. This was uh, pictures taken of uh, an ash plume from a volcano in Russia in 2009. And it was, uh, it was great information for the people that were monitoring this ash cloud to see how it was forming and how it was traveling. So the astronauts, astronauts literally had a, a sky's eye view. And we've had our, our fair share of these as well. These are, this is a hurricane that's uh, over the Atlantic usually. And uh, astronaut Terry Virts um, took this shot straight out uh, on the horizon of the Earth. And I really enjoy this uh, shot because, number one, there's the Milky Way coming up in the distance. But also it shows you how thin our atmosphere is. Our atmosphere is only about 100 miles thick, and the Earth is 8,000 miles uh, thick wide. And so that just shows you how tenuous our atmosphere is, and we really need to take care of our environment. OK, that's, uh, I told you, I said before how we uh, get supplies up, and how about, how about people? And so crew transport right now is relegated to two spacecraft, and that's the Soyuz, which can carry three people, and the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon, which could carry up to seven. Um, 
in years past, when the station was being developed and before um, uh, and, and, and up until 2011, the uh, space shuttle was the way United States got uh, people up to the space station. The Soyuz has always been flying ever since the beginning. But the space shuttle retired in 2011, and so uh, there had to be a replacement for that, and that was SpaceX. But here's the Soyuz, though. Let me just show you a little bit about how, how that works. The Soyuz is actually uh, three uh, components to its spacecraft. It goes up on a rocket also called the Soyuz. And it's only the central part of the Soyuz that contains the astronauts. Now, this part right here, this part up here is a habitat in case they have to spend more than a day in orbit. That's where there's food and a bathroom and things like that. But to go up to space to launch and to land, <clears throat> they're in this center uh, segment right here. And the uh, segment on the back here, uh, that's all fuel and supplies and solar cells. When it uh, leaves the space station to come back, it, uh, it uh, leaves the station as its three segment self, but then the three segments break apart because only that middle segment, which has the crew in it, comes back. The other two pieces uh, burn up in the atmosphere. Um, the Soyuz has one giant parachute that comes out and it slowly uh, uh, drops them into the steppes of uh, Russia. It looks like it crashed there with all that uh, dust and dirt, but what that is, is there's actually some rockets that fire just before it lands to cushion the landing. And so that's being kicked up by the rockets. And then in Russia, a whole flotilla of uh, helicopters and uh, trucks and support vehicles go out, they erect a tent to help take, the, uh, take care of the astronauts. Here's that center section that I mentioned. Uh, sometimes it lands straight up like this, which is good. And sometimes it's on its side and they can work that too. But when it stands up like this or, or, or lands straight up like this, they erect this little platform on top of it so they can get up there and pull the, uh, pull the, uh, the crew out one at a time. I kind of just like to show you a short video, but I want to first introduce uh, Anne McLean. Anne is in the red there. She's a US astronaut. And I think she's all of uh, five foot one. And this is her first time coming back. Yeah, we're just the crowd and <laughs> looking very excited to be back on Earth. You can see how they popped and her out of there very easily. And I think we have a few of Anne's friends and family here in Mission Control Houston hearing some cheers from our viewing gallery as uh, Astro Animal makes her way out of the capsule. I think she just spent four months in space. And so, again, this was Anne's first to help her get reacclimated in space. to a heck of a, the gravity of Earth. They for make sure they flight. hold on to her so she doesn't fall over and gets her Earth legs back. She looks like she came through well. There's she looks actually like a little slide right there now. that they kind of help her down. And notice there's five people helping her, and she still kind of slips here. Watch. Yep. <laughs> but uh, then she's carried over to over some here. lawn chairs uh, where they uh, they sit them down. And <clears throat> because, uh, again, they don't want them walking around right, right away. They want to check their vital signs. So all of the returning crew, <clears throat> excuse me, all the returning crew get their blood pressure and vitals checked to make sure everything's okay. They're also given cell phones so they can call friends and family back home. You'll notice the uh, spacecrafts in the background. They're still attending to it. And everybody and his brother is gathered uh, to be in the picture so they can say they were there. So that's how the Soyuz works. It's worked very successfully for many, many, many years. Um, the new kid on the block is uh, SpaceX. This is the United States answer to uh, bringing astronauts uh, up and back uh, from uh, low Earth orbit. And this is what the inside of the uh, uh, crew SpaceX uh, looks like. Um, here is showing four. Like I said, it could hold seven. Uh, it's launched on a Falcon 9 rocket from uh, Cape Kennedy. And it first launched uh, astronauts uh, in May of last year. Doug Hurley and Bob Bacon were the first two to go up as a test. And uh, it attaches to the space station through its nose like this. And uh, they stay for as long as they need to. And then when they come back, it uh, um, goes through the atmosphere with its heat shield. But it, uh, just like the old Apollo days, it lands in the water off the Florida coast. 
and then a, a specially designed ship comes out to hoist it up and, and bring it back. And so that's uh, the crew dragon. There's a cargo dragon and a crew dragon. And so uh, after that flight, there have been two more. They call them crew one. Uh, crew two is up there right now. They're coming back next month. And crew three will be launching on Halloween to uh, uh, replace those on the space station. So we've got a very nice SpaceX uh, Dragon crew dragon here working just fine. Uh, Boeing has also built a, um, a craft to take astronauts back and forth. Uh, they call it the Starliner, but unfortunately they've been having some technical problems with it. And so it's been delayed uh, until next year, but you'll be hearing that come on board as well. And then the United States will have two ways to get astronauts up and back to low earth orbit. Um, let me just end by saying you can see the space station fly overhead at night. Uh, it's very easy. It's just not every night. Um, there are many websites you can go to um, to find this. I like this one. It's called heavensabove.com, and it will show you a chart like this. And I looked to see if it was going to be flying overhead tonight. It's not. It's only in the early morning hours. And in fact, it's not going to be flying overhead until like November 20th. But keep this in mind because you can see it as a bright dot moving across the sky very, very easily. Uh, and um, Heavens Above also gives you a star map that you can actually plot it going right across the sky. So it's very easy to find. And you can impress the heck out of your uh, friends, families, and neighbors when you do that. So spot the station sometime. It's a lot of fun. Say, hey, look, on that dot, there are seven people right now. Um, Space Station has a Twitter account. You can follow them on Twitter, see what they're doing. Some recent events that have happened is uh, Russia has added a whole new uh, module uh, to the station. It was supposed to have been added years ago, but there were delays and it's another laboratory module. So this one is dedicated uh, uh, for Russian activities and was attached to the station. So there's another whole piece to the station, constantly growing. And then you may have heard about in the news, they decided to send up uh, an actress and a director to make a movie on the space station. And so there she is and there they are. And I understand they're back now and We'll have to look forward to a, a true uh, uh, movie made in space. What's going to happen for the future? Well, that's pretty exciting because all these slides I'm going to show you now, which is not that many, are all going to be most likely happening in this decade. Uh, here it is 2021, but by the end of this decade, there's going to be a lot of accomplishments. Uh, Axiom Space is already contracted with NASA to add modules to the station that will eventually then detach from the station and become its own space station. Um, this could actually easily lead to something like a luxury space hotel. Don't uh, laugh it away because uh, you, you see more and more civilians are going into space and uh, it's not gonna take that much more, certainly by the end of the decade, uh, for someone to put together some kind of an orbital habitat where you can go on vacation for a week. Sounds pretty exciting. Uh, Bigelow Aerospace has inflatable modules, and there's a, 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 a company called Orbital Assembly, which is actually talking about making a, a huge uh, circular station, kind of like we saw in 2001, and uh, they're, they've got plans to uh, try to put this together by the end of the decade as well. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite an amazing adventure, as you can see, and if there are any youngsters listening, um, this could be you. Um, we're learning how to live in space in low Earth orbit, but the whole idea is also to get ourselves to Mars. So you just never know what's going to be happening. If you want to learn more about the space station, there's actually a PDF of 116 pages called the ISS Reference Guide. You can find that on the NASA website. And if you want to have some fun, I do believe there's a Lego uh, set with 864 pieces where you can build something that kind of looks like the space station and have fun with that. Lastly, I'll just introduce you to my website, which is astronomynj.com. I'll answer questions now, but if you think of something later, you can reach me at paul at astronomynj.com. My website has various things on there. It tells you where I'll be talking, some helpful space information, how to look at the sky at night, and other objects that are going on. So I thank you very, very much. And if you have any questions, just unmute yourself and fire away. Uh, Paul, it's Jim. First, let me thank you so very much for presenting this evening. It was an uh, absolute wealth of information. Um, 
he makes me proud to uh, uh, to be alive during this period of time to see this amount of research and also it's very exciting to see where we're going in the future and and I know that young people are aspiring to be uh, astronauts and um, you know making that uh, a decision and going after that is it's a wonderful thing and I think you you know the the presentations that you provide to organizations really really helps make that happen I, I would want to thank you again very much for for that and for uh, presenting this evening we don't oh, have any, any any questions on the YouTube channel but we are still here uh, on zoom and if there are no questions I'm gonna go ahead and kill the stream any questions before I end our YouTube stream to capture that for everybody Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let me end the stream here. Nope, I muted it. I was trying to get there, our cameras on the station that are constantly uh, uh, looking at Earth, and I was thought 